We live in a day and age where it seems like the crazier people talk, the more people love it. And the more outlandish people act, the more, uh, the more notoriety they get. And we, we look at our world around us, and sometimes we're tempted to blend in with our culture and to think the way to make an impact is to engage in these ungodly habits of speech. And indeed, uh, many Christians find themselves being tempted to speak in wrong ways because that is the prevailing uh, wind of the culture around us. Now, let me mention that it's not as if it's gotten worse in the sense that it's never been like this before. Uh, Sins of the tongue have been around since Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and sinned against God. And then uh, their children and passed down. And we see many references in the Scripture, and particularly here in the book of Proverbs, to the importance and the value of our words. Our words are powerful. Our words have great value. Our words can either build up or tear down. There's a curious phrase that's used here in Proverbs 18.20 where he says, "...a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth." And, and we think, boy, that's, that sounds kind of unusual. What is that talking about? The, the belly in the Scriptures often referred to the seat of emotions, to the inner man. And it's the idea that when we, when we speak in the right way, there is great satisfaction to us in our inner man." Uh, the, with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. He goes on in verse 21 to tell us death and life are in the power of the tongue. The tongue is very powerful. Uh, if we're careful to learn how to speak in a way that is honoring to the Lord and edifying to our brothers and sisters in Christ, then we will find that the end of verse 21 will also be true, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Our words are very powerful. Uh, We find oftentimes that we are looking for certain kinds of words to be spoken to us, uh, encouraging words, uh, words that will that will uplift us and uh, make us make us feel a certain way. And and we learn what kind of words we like to we like to hear from others. What would be a better practice is for us to learn and identify those kind of words and go out of our way to use those kind of words with people around us. Uh, We find, for instance, that encouraging words are few and far between in our world, aren't they? What we find more of is complaining words and the words that are, that are uh, expressing discontentment with whatever the lot in life is. But uh, when we find someone who is an encourager, boy, that's a, that's a person that you want to be around. You, you enjoy being around that kind of an individual. Because our words are so powerful, and because they're a necessary and ordinary part of our lives on a daily basis, we should learn how to exercise wisdom in this important arena of our Christian life. We want to learn to walk in wisdom with our words. And as we've said, the book of Proverbs has much to say about our words, the value of our words, and the importance of using good and edifying speech. Tonight we want to look at several principles about our speech from the book of Proverbs, and I hope these will be a help to you, and I think it will be practical enough that you can put it to work right away tonight in your speech. Notice, first of all, we'll turn to Proverbs chapter 10... The first principle about our words is we should learn to spare our words. Learn to spare your words. What do I mean by that? It's good to learn when to be quiet. Do you know sometimes when there is silence, it's uncomfortable. And silence uh, begs to be filled. And oftentimes... Uh, when, when people are silent, when someone else is silent, we feel compelled to rush to fill the silence. And in, the, in that process, in using too many words, we can find ourselves in a bad situation. We need to learn how to spare our words. If I could put this another way, learn that not everything needs to come out of your mouth. Not everything should be said. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 19 says this so plainly, "...in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise." That word refraineth is very interesting. 
uh, a synonymous word or a similar word would be restraineth. To, to learn to hold back your speech. Now, now we understand that uh, it is a normal function of life for us to speak to one another. And if you just uh, develop the habit of never talking, then that's not going to go over too well either. Uh, that's going to cause some problems. But we could learn how to restrain or refrain our words. And we need to learn how perhaps not to say so much because in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. For instance, if you are someone and in your occupation, words are a part of what you do, then you'll have to be very careful that in your words, uh, just because there's a multitude of those words, that you're careful not to sin. Uh, I know as a pastor, I have to be careful. A lot of what I do is talking, talking to people, talking on the phone, interacting with individuals in difficult situations. And, you know, when you speak a lot of words, you can find yourself saying things that are not pleasing to the Lord. And we must be careful in the multitude of words. Sometimes we need to learn how to zip our lip. Learn to refrain your lips, and you will be counted as wise. Look, look with me at Proverbs chapter 17, which says... Uh, something very similar to this. Proverbs chapter 17, verse number 27. The Bible says here, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So tonight, if you want to be seen as someone who is wise, and you want others to, to believe that you have a lot of intelligence, one of the best things you can do is learn not to fill in the silence so much. Uh, the truth is, a lot of times when we speak too much, then we share not our wisdom, but our foolishness. And, and it becomes apparent to people. Uh, th this is an important part, and, and we'll say this, that the reason that we need to learn to spare our words I believe, and why the book of Proverbs talks about this so frequently, is because while we are sparing our words, we should be listening to what the other person has to say. And when you listen, when you're a good listener, it shows that you value that other person and what they have to say. Uh, that's the way to build a strong relationship. Some people think, you know, to be, a, to be a, a good person in relationships, you've got to learn to communicate a lot and com communicate well. And communication is important, but learning to listen is also important. Uh, I would say learning to listen without defending yourself so fast. Learning to listen without offering a counter argument so quickly, learning to listen without feeling like you need to correct what the other person has said immediately, learning to spare your words. How many times have I jumped into a conversation to correct something that someone was saying only to find out that I completely misunderstood what they were saying and ended up offending them in the process? Learning to spare your words is an important mark of wisdom. I think it's important for children to be taught so that they can learn how to listen and be quiet uh, at times. And of course, it's fine for them to speak, but also for them to learn to listen and to show that they value the opinions of others around them. It's not necessary for them always to be talking and correcting and, and sharing their opinion. Likewise, it's important for us. And, and, you know, people have different personalities. Some people naturally are quieter than others. Uh, for those who do not tend towards the quietness, but rather you have more of a loquacious personality, and, and uh, that would be in modern vernacular, you'd be more of a chatterbox, and uh, you tend to, to talk a lot, then you're going to have to learn how to spare your words, how to be quiet, and to learn to listen to what others have to say. When you do that, then the Bible says others will look at you, and you will instantly be regarded as someone with wisdom or knowledge. It is the man who has knowledge who spares his words. He knows, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, he knows the value of a well-placed word, and he carefully plans the things that he will say so that they can have the maximum impact. Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. Now, I know you all are sparing in your words tonight, but if you want to say amen every once in a while, it won't offend me. 
Proverbs 21, 23, the Bible says this, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Don't you love the language of the book of Proverbs sometimes? I, I like that verse. I, I think it's a, good time, it's a good lesson for us sometimes to learn. Just shut up. Just don't say what you think you have to say. I tell you, sometimes, oh, sometimes there's just something in there and you want to, I want to say, I'm, I'm saying you, but I'm, I really mean me. I want to say what, what's in there. And, and so if you bite your tongue or whatever you need to do not to say it, and then a little bit later, after you have time to process what happened and how it happened and, and so on, there have been times that I thought, Phew, I'm so glad I didn't say what I wanted to say. Because that would have really caused a lot more problems. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes I speak when I shouldn't and end up in a lot of trouble. When we don't learn how to keep our mouth and our tongue, then we're going to find that troubles will come to us. You know, a lot of people ask for trouble just by the way that they speak to others around them. One of the most important things that police officers and those who enforce the law are to learn in their training is something called de-escalation. How to bring a conflict down to a different level by answering carefully and by not throwing gasoline on a fire. Learning to be careful with our words. Learn to spare your words. Second of all tonight, the value of our words insists that we not only learn to spare our words, but second of all, let your words be pleasant words. Let your words be pleasant words. Proverbs chapter 15, we have a limited number of words, a finite number of words that we can speak in any given day. We're going to speak to a finite number of people. Uh, There's a limited amount of time limited amount of words that we can fit into the day. And because we're going to be careful and spare our words and plan our words, Proverbs chapter 15 says this. Look at verse number 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Pleasant words. Uh, We ought to be careful to use the kind of words that we wouldn't mind hearing in return from someone else. Be careful what you say. Be careful how you say it. Learn to exercise pleasant words. Do you know it's possible even in the midst of correction to have pleasant words? I think sometimes as, as parents, we may feel like when we're correcting our children that we need to use unpleasant words to express our displeasure. Now, that's not always necessary. And we can speak in a way that is pleasing to the Lord and that is pleasant, but that also has the truth and corrects. Uh, we need to learn how to be careful with our words that we use pleasant words. How many people around us go through their day without hearing hardly a pleasant word? Showing an interest in someone, smiling at them, expressing to them that you care about them with the words that you use, goes much farther, much farther than the unpleasant words that most people hear. I I think even, you know, as we interact with people who are involved in service industries and and that sort of thing, you you know the kind of comments that they normally hear during the day are people who are displeased, people who are upset about something, people who are complaining about something. And And uh, it's a good practice for us to learn to express thankfulness and gratefulness and pleasant words to people, especially when we appreciate their service to us. Uh, We ought to go out of our way to learn and cultivate the practice of pleasant words. How do we do that? Well, Proverbs chapter 16 talks about this in verses 23 and 24. The Bible there says, "...the heart of the wise teacheth his mouth, and addeth learning to his lips." Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. So there's a couple of important thoughts here in these verses. First of all, in verse 23, there's a concept that we can teach our lips. If you're a wise person, you will spend time thinking about, how can I say things in a way that is pleasant? 
How can I say things in a way that will help people, that will encourage people, that will uplift them? In other words, we ought to really do more than just say the things that come naturally. Most of us have words or phrases or reactions that come to us naturally, which are both unpleasant and not pleasing to the Lord. And if we're wise, we will learn to spend time in our, and I believe this comes through meditation upon the scriptures and and thinking practically about how to interact with other people, but we can learn uh, to teach our mouth. We can teach our mouth the type of things that we ought to say that will be pleasant, and we can add learning to our lips. In other words, you're not bound by the patterns of the ways that you have always spoken. You can learn some new tricks, even if you're an old dog. You can learn some new ways of speaking, even if you have some baggage, even if you have some ways that that are not so pleasant. God says that you can learn pleasant speech. And then he goes on in verse 24, and he tells us these pleasant words are as in honeycomb. How, How many of you have ever eaten honeycomb with honey in it? A couple of you? Oh, you're missing one of life's greatest pleasures. I think one of the greatest parts of keeping bees is getting to eat honeycomb. And uh, well, I won't get into all that, but uh, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful thing. Certainly in Bible days, before refined sugar and the sort of things that we associate as sweets today, this would have been like the pinnacle of sweetness and satisfaction. This would have been, this would have been something that everyone would have said, oh, that's a, that's a great thing to have honeycomb. Pleasant words are like that. Pleasant words that are spoken to another person are like honeycomb to that person. They're sweet to the soul and their health to their bones. Uh, we can practically, we can encourage and we can uplift and we can strengthen and we can help people. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you come to church or you maybe go to another, a, a different place, a social gathering, and you're looking to receive some encouragement. That, it's hard to find. But when you go looking to encourage someone, you end up being encouraged yourself. I I find this often uh, when I have opportunity to visit shut-ins or people who are in the hospital. Oftentimes, I find I go to encourage them, and in turn, they encourage me. Uh, There is a great value that comes when we learn to speak... But we do not do this naturally. This is not something that comes to us easily. You don't have to teach a child to speak harsh, ugly words. But you do have to teach them to speak pleasant words. Sadly, many people have grown up never having learned the value of pleasant words. Never having learned the importance of sharing those kind of words. I think also about this when I consider the value and the, and, and the place of pleasant words, that there are times that we tend to be more pleasant with people who are complete strangers than we do with those who are nearest and dearest to us. We ought to be so careful with the words that we use and be careful to choose pleasant, loving, kind words. Proverbs chapter 12 shows a little bit of a contrast to this in verse number 18. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 18. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. You know, the the words that you use can be just as painful and just as hurtful as if you took a a sword and ran it right through them. But in contrast to that, we have the opportunity to administer health. You say, health? You mean the way that we speak to other people can actually affect their health? Well, interestingly, it can certainly have an impact on their physical health because pleasant words go a long ways towards providing an environment of security, of love, of empathy and compassion Uh, In other words, an environment which is free of a lot of stress. And when we do the opposite, that can cause those kind of problems. But uh, we know that the tongue of the wise is health spiritually. If we learn to speak pleasant words, if we learn to speak in a way that is wise and that is pleasing to the Lord and that is encouraging to others, that promotes other people's spiritual health. 
Uh, we ought to go out of our way to speak these kind of words to others that will administer health to them. Here's an interesting one in Proverbs chapter 18. Verse number 8 speaks about some specific kinds of words that are damaging. And here it says, "...the words of a talebearer are as wounds." And they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. A talebearer is someone who goes around to slander. Someone who goes around and spreads news about someone else in order to damage them. And that is damaging. When people hear about someone else who is talking about them, that hurts. Uh, that goes down. It, it stings very deeply. And we find that that these kind of words can be very harmful. But that's not the kind of words that God wants us to be sharing. God wants us uh, not to be talebearers. He wants us to be encouragers. Uh, if we have a problem with someone, with a brother in Christ, then we should go and sit down with that brother in Christ face to face and speak to them about our problem rather than going to someone else and, and speaking to them about the problem that we have. Uh, we ought to be careful that our words are ministering health and that they are not damaging those around us. God wants us not to be talebearers, but to be encouragers. I have a particular author that I read after sometimes. He mostly writes business books. He's not a believer. But uh, one of his things that he encourages people to do, which I think is a really good, really good counsel, is to play the reverse gossip game. And the reverse gossip game is this. Instead of going and telling someone something bad about someone else, go behind their back and tell somebody something good about them and, uh, and brag on them a little bit when they aren't listening and they don't know. Because what you're doing is, in a roundabout way, you're encouraging that person. Listen, eventually it's going to get back to them that you're speaking in that way about them. Uh, and we ought to look for ways to encourage one another in that way. Go to Proverbs chapter 31, finally. We're talking about pleasant words. Proverbs chapter 31 is the chapter that speaks about the virtuous woman. And one of the marks of the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, verse 26, it says this, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Isn't that so descriptive? Her tongue is ruled by the law of kindness. She's careful that the things that she says are ruled by kindness. You know, I think in our homes, we would do well if we would learn how to share this kind of kind and pleasant speech with one another. If we would learn to encourage one another. You say, oh, that's a bunch of mushy, gushy positivity, that kind of stuff. There's, there's negative things we have to talk about. There certainly are. There certainly are negative things we have to talk about in the world. But I think there's a biblical case for speaking in pleasant ways, for speaking in encouraging ways, and especially for speaking with kindness to one another. You know, when you come to church on Sunday morning and you see someone who's serving, someone who's doing something, and maybe they're not doing their job the right way. Maybe they're not doing all the things that they're supposed to do. You know, a kind word goes a lot farther than, than telling them what they're doing wrong. Uh, a kind word, an uplifting word. Many of you know, you go to work all week and you come to the house of God hoping to be encouraged and hoping to fellowship and hoping to be challenged from the scriptures, yes. And we hope that someone will encourage us. We ought to go out of our way to share pleasant words with those around us and to uplift those who are weary. This is one of the functions of the Lord's church, that it ought to be a place, a venue of encouragement, of sharing pleasant words one with another. Now, for some of you, that means we're going to have to rule snow out of our vocabulary for the next several months. Amen. Let your words be pleasant words. Third of all, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. Yes, we should learn to spare our words. We should let our words be pleasant words. But third of all, we should avoid hasty words. Avoid hasty words. Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 20 says this, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. You know, we live in a day and age of instant communication. 
instant communication. You can get a text message from someone and instantly they want an answer. Uh, You get a phone call. Okay, I want you to deal with this problem right now. You get an email. Okay, here's this situation. You know, we need to learn how to be careful with our words and not be hasty. I found in my life that a lot of times my knee-jerk reaction, the thing that I want to say in the moment, is not at all the right thing to say. And the more that I think about it, the more I realize that's not going to help the situation. That's going to cause more problems than it's going to solve. You know, if somebody, if somebody calls you a name and you call them a name back, it's probably not going to help the situation. If someone yells at you and you yell louder at them back, it's probably not going to help the situation. Uh, you, you ought to learn how to be careful not to be hasty in your words. Not to, not to just spill out the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, there is more hope of a fool than of a man who is hasty in his words. Boy, that's descriptive. Turn to Proverbs chapter 15, which speaks about this. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The Bible here says, A soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Now think about verse 1, a verse that you and I have heard many times. A soft answer turneth away wrath. I don't know about you, but when someone is angry at me, I, I don't feel like giving them a soft answer. I, I feel like flexing my muscles. I feel like showing them, do you know who you're talking to? You, to? Do you know what I can do? Do you know how I feel about this? Maybe you don't feel that way. Maybe you react in a different way. But I'll tell you, my natural reaction is, okay, you're upset with me. I'll give it right back to you. But you know, every time I've ever done that, I found that the situation didn't get better, it got worse. Now, it takes a great deal of humility to offer a soft answer when someone is screaming at you, when someone is yelling at you and telling you, uh, giving you a piece of their mind. What I feel like saying when someone is, is giving me a piece of their mind is saying, please don't, you can't spare any, keep it. And, uh, but that's not going to help the, ans- the, the, the situation. That's not a soft answer. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Uh, We've got to be careful to learn how to respond in a way that is not hasty. Our initial reaction is usually not a righteous reaction. We ought to stop and think. Uh, You know, a lot of times, uh, text messages and things like that, and sometimes in in our day and age, people like to communicate about difficult things via that vehicle, and it's not, not really a good way to solve problems, first of all. But second of all, you've got to be really careful with that, that you're not just firing responses back. Because a lot of times what you're going to say is going to be something that you're going to regret. You remember hearing probably about Abraham Lincoln, who when his critics would level criticism about him, he would sit down and write out a lengthy letter of rebuttal and all the reasons why they were wrong. And then he would take the letter and put it in his desk and never send it. Because he often felt that, okay, we'll just leave it alone, let it be as it is. And we ought to learn to be careful about the hasty answer. Many times uh, we feel like, I just got to get it off my chest. I just got to tell people how I feel. I got to tell them what I'm thinking. Maybe not. Maybe that's not a good thing. And, and the real reason we've got to be careful about this, by the way, is because the eyes of the Lord are in every place. The Lord is watching how we speak to one another. He's he's looking at our interactions. He's paying attention to how we treat one another and how we respond to one another. I like verse 2 as well. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. It's like you can't turn the faucet off. Stop. Stop saying so much garbage, and it just keeps coming out and coming out. It pours out foolishness. A wise person is going to be very careful with their words, and they're not going to be hasty with their words because they realize that hasty answers are not wholesome answers. 
And verse 4 tells us that a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Learning to speak in the right way can bring life to your relationships. It can, it can rejuvenate and renew relationships if you will learn to speak in a way that is kind and patient and, and uh, according to the Scriptures and not according to the feeling of your flesh. So we need to learn to avoid hasty words. Now, uh, you're going to see that all four of these principles follow a, a definite theme tonight. So turn to Proverbs chapter 25 as we consider the last one. Learn to spare your words. Let your words be pleasant words. Avoid hasty words. And finally, number four, learn the power of carefully chosen words. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11 and 12 really spells this out. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. You know, learning to frame our words in the right way, learning to carefully choose the words that we use with one another, goes a long ways towards building strong relationships. We need to learn that there is great power when we choose words carefully. You know, words are powerful things. And the reason is because words express what is on the inside. Do you ever struggle sometimes to find the right word to express what is on the inside? Sometimes you think, okay, this is how I feel about this, or this is what I think about this but I'm not exactly sure how to put it into words exactly. Maybe that's a function of how we are as human beings so that we'll slow down and think about what words we should use because words are powerful. Words convey meaning. Words tell people what is in our heart. Whether we like it or not, the words that we use reveal to someone else a picture of what's on the inside. And, and they may be mistaken in their interpretation, certainly. We may have not expressed it well, and maybe we confuse them. But, you know, we do express what's on the inside by what we say with our words. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, Jesus said. So when we learn to speak in the right way, it's like apples of gold and pictures of silver. We ought to study how to speak in a powerful way. I think it would be a good practice for us to learn, how can I speak words that are encouraging and meaningful to the people around me? And instead of just, you know, the the easy come, easy go kind of words that, that come out of our mouth without any preparation or thought, I think if we learn to choose our words carefully and on purpose, we take the opportunity to encourage people, uh, to lift them up, to use kind and pleasant words, those words can be very powerful. Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. Look at verse number 20. The Bible there says, The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. You know, when he says the tongue of the just is as choice silver, the idea is that the just man has a valuable tongue because he has learned how to speak in a way that is honoring to God. And in the next verse, we find out that the lips of the righteous feed many. By learning to speak in the right way, we can can feed people. We can nourish them with our words. If we learn to use the right words, those words can be extremely powerful in a positive way in the, the life of another person. Look down at verses 31 and 32 in the same chapter, Proverbs chapter 10. Verse 31 says, The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh frowardness. You know, we ought to be careful that what we're saying is wisdom, that that what is coming out of our mouth is truth, that, that we know 
that what we're saying is acceptable before God, that it is that, it is that which is pleasing to the Lord. Because what comes naturally is frowardness. It's foolish talk, a foolish jesting. The book of Ephesians refers to it. And, and just idle chit-chat and, and, and not intentional in any way uh, with, the, with the purpose of encouraging and lifting up and, and bringing others to the knowledge of the truth. You and I ought to learn the power of carefully chosen words. Now, I realize that not that most of you aren't in an occupation where you speak publicly. But I think a lot about how to convey what I want to say in a powerful way. Okay, how can I communicate what I'm trying to communicate in a way that people will understand? And then on an individual level, I know what kind of preparation I put into preparing for like a message, a sermon that I'm going to preach or a lesson that I'm going to teach. But in an individual, one-on-one basis, we ought to put that kind of thought and preparation into choosing our words, the words that we're going to use with others. We ought to look for ways to intentionally express specific gratitude when we have the opportunity. We ought to look for opportunities to encourage, to lift up, to build up. You say, now, Pastor, you haven't said anything about negative speech, about correction, and and all that sort of thing. No, I haven't. I I haven't purposely, I haven't dealt with that tonight. I've just chosen this subject. The book of Proverbs does talk about that as well, and that's an important function of speech. The only thing I'm going to say about that tonight is that even when we are correcting and administrating the truth to someone who needs to hear it, we ought to be careful to choose our words, and we ought to be careful to have the right kind of spirit when we're speaking. I don't know anybody who responds to a rebuke when they feel like the person who is rebuking them is just out to get them. Most people react to that. Most people don't like being rebuked anyway. And so we ought to go out of our way to help people to understand our spirit in communicating uh, what what we are saying to them, the correction that we are sharing with them. And so we ought to be careful to learn that our words are very powerful. I want you to understand tonight, the words that you use shape your relationships. So if you find yourself feeling like, I don't have the kind of relationship in my marriage that I want to have, there's probably some words that need to be changed. If you find yourself with some difficulties with your children, perhaps there are some words that need to be changed. If perhaps at work you're struggling with your coworkers there most likely are some words that need to be changed. Now, I realize you could say it's all on the other person. It's all their fault. And, and I'm, and I'm going to say this. You can't change them, but you can change you. You can go out of your way to learn to speak in ways that are pleasing to the Lord and that will be pleasant to the other person. Go out of your way to use pleasant, gracious words that will lift up the other person while you administer truth in the relationship and I'll tell you that that can have an, a healing effect on, re, on the relationships that you're in. The words that we use are very powerful. Now, two more verses I want to look at tonight before we close. Proverbs chapter 17. Because as we think about this, this subject of our words, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like, how do you do that? I mean, I know what comes naturally from my heart. I know what naturally comes out of my mouth without any preparation. I don't, I don't have to think twice about it. If I just let whatever I whatever wanted to come out of my mouth, if I just let it come out, that wouldn't be good. I didn't have to have any practice with that. But this kind of speech that we've talked about tonight, this is difficult. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 17, first of all. The Bible tells us this, "...he that hath a froward heart findeth no good." And he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. Now, what I want you to notice in verse 20 is the tie that the author of Proverbs here puts between the heart and the tongue. The heart is froward and the tongue is perverse. And so you say, I I need to change the way that I speak. I need to to grow in this area. You, You know what you need to learn to do? First of all, you need to change your heart. 
First of all, your heart needs to have a transformation. You say, how do I do that? You need to deal with these things on a thought level. You need to deal with them in your, in your inner man. How do you talk to other people on the inside? Not the words that come out, but what are the words that are on the inside? And do you correct those? Do you allow the Holy Spirit to correct those inside of you and say, you know, that is not right for me to be thinking that way about that person. I need to repent of that thought. Okay, so we need to deal with it on a heart level. The, the problem that we have with our speech is not a speech problem so much as it is a heart problem. Proverbs chapter 16 is this, verse number 1, and we'll conclude with this verse. How can we have a, the right kind of speech? Ultimately, Proverbs 16, 1 says, "...the preparations of the heart in man..." And the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. You know the reality is that all of us need to have the Lord change our heart and change our words. We cannot have the kind of speech that's been spoken about in the book of Proverbs without the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Without the power of God, we cannot uh, be these, th- these kind of communicators that will be able to communicate truth in a way that is pleasant and acceptable to those around us so that it would have a life-changing effect. That's what we ought to desire, but that is something that God can produce in us. As believers, I think what we ought to pray tonight is, Lord, would you help me to walk in wisdom so that I can learn to speak words that will communicate your power to the world around me. You know, the world around us desperately needs to see the power of God. And it's nice to say, you know, I, I preach the gospel by how I live. That's nice. You, you ought to be a good testimony. But you know, you really preach the gospel by what you say. We ought to learn as believers how to share the gospel in a powerful way. And yes, even in a pleasant way so that it would have maximum impact in people's lives. We ought to learn how to interact with people around us in pleasant ways, in ways that are powerful, with words that are carefully chosen, so that the Holy Spirit of God can use those words to shape our relationships so that they might reach their full potential. All of this is possible, but only by the power of God, because the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. May God help us this week, the rest of this week, to value our words and to find ways to speak in a manner that is pleasing and glorifying.